Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, panel on the financial crisis. Uh, this panel is a first uh, for two reasons for the EFA. Uh, the EFA traditionally hasn't had panels. And the second innovation is that I welcome not only the people in the room, but also the people who are watching this panel through uh, the webcast. We have four panelists. The first one is John Cochran from the University of Chicago. He is also the current president of the American Finance Association. The second panelist is Simon Johnson from MIT. He was uh, also the chief economist of the IMF. The third panelist is Raghu Rajan from the University of Chicago. And he's a future president of the AFA and is also a former chief economist of the IMF. The fourth panelist is an in a taxi on his way to the panel and <laughs> is uh, Myron Scholes. The way that I decided to organize a panel is we will go through five questions related to the financial crisis, starting from causes and ending up with kind of the state of the finance uh, profession. And we'll take each one of the uh, questions at a, at a time. The first one was motivated by the debacle of the crisis commission, where they concluded that they really couldn't agree among Republicans and Democrats on the causes of the crisis. So I, my question is whether with the benefit of time, it is possible for financial economists to reach some agreement. And more precisely uh, to each of the panelists, if they had to say which factor played the greatest role in the crisis in causing the crisis, what would it be? And we'll start with uh, John and go alphabetically, hoping that my own will be here uh, at, at the right time. The, the, advantage, the advantages of having a C for a last name. Um, so you asked two questions. Uh, can, can financial economists agree how many centuries do you have? Um, can you hear at the back? So we need to turn this mic on. It is on. Speak closer. How's that? Okay, good. We can then we can pass the mic around. So uh, Renee's first question was, "Can financial economists agree?" And my answer was, "How many centuries do you have?" Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, your second question is, if I had to say what happened, well, that one I can answer. Um, I think the central thing that made this financial crisis is we had a run, a good old-fashioned run. So it did not particularly new in the sense of economics. It knew in where it was. We had a run in the shadow banking system. Uh, we discovered that uh, a lot of new uh, securities, like um, overnight repurchase agreements, uh, bro prime brokerage agreements, and derivatives contract had the classic ingredients of a run-prone security. If one guy pulls out early, that makes the institution uh, less liquid and gives the other people an incentive to pull out sooner. Uh, we've known how that works for a long time. The surprise is, is where it was. Without that run, there's all sorts of other stuff that went wrong. But, but finance is about people making money and people losing money. That you can lose money on mortgages, on tech stocks, on all sorts of things. And it doesn't, it, it, you know, it's unfortunate, but all you can really do is go home and kick the dog and, and have a drink. Um, what turns those into a crisis and, and made this a big event was the run. And, and from my mind, that's the important thing to focus on. And of course, that run was set up by all sorts of other things, which is where people get in, you know, that, then we'll have some more fun on causes of the, of the, of the crash. Uh, to my mind, some big important things that set up the run was that a lot of the shadow banking system existed to get around the previous uh, uh, regulatory regime. Uh, it's a lot, I think financial innovation is great and lots of it's good, but, but some of it was kind of artificially there. And, and therefore, we hadn't really thought about the run proneness of these new assets. Uh, the second part, of course, was the, the too big to fail problem. Uh, our markets had gotten into a, a big problem of moral hazard and, and the expectation that it was too big to fail. Uh, politics, in my mind, did not help because when you're on the edge of a bank run, people are, are sensitive to news and, and sensitive to what's going to happen. And so chaos out of Washington, it's sort of like every time somebody's in danger, it's, it's like electing a new pope. The black smoke goes up, the white smoke goes up. This does not help uh, stability in markets. So that's, I think, what the central feature was. And, and I think we're at a moment where it's important to focus on central features uh, 
uh, clear economics, and, and now, now we will put to test my thesis about whether financial economists can agree on anything. Uh, next is Simon. So I, I'm not sure uh, that, that there'll ever be complete agreement, but I think there is some, some, some convergence uh, on these issues. And, and I think um, perhaps more convergence than, than you might think. And, and I think the, the, the literature on this and, and the thinking is, is moving very much in the direction of, of um, the way some other people think about meteor impact. There's a, there's a, there's a very well-developed scientific literature on the blast radius. Uh, that you get and the, and the environmental impact and the potential planetary impact when a meteor strikes the Earth. And there's a number of factors that matter, including the angle of impact, where the meteor hits, the exact composition of the meteor, and the size of the meteor. And the difference, by the way, uh, the big difference between the meteors that end life on the planet that lead to one of these great extinctions, of which uh, we think we've had five or six, and, and the ones that merely have local damage and, and some trauma uh, over some thousands of miles, the big difference uh, is size. It's not the only thing that matters. It's not, there are other elements that, that, go, that go into this. And, and I think that that discussion around what are the elements and what are particularly, what, what is the issue around regulatory capture? How did the people, the most powerful, uh, well-financed private sector people become so powerful in Washington? I mean, to be blunt, uh, e even I, who have been rather, um, aggressively skeptical of the Obama administration and, and its views on Wall Street and its views on, on why saving a very few big banks and, and, and the people running them, why that is, is, was a mistaken policy and has continued to lead us in the wrong direction, I think going forward builds towards another financial debacle. Even I am, am shocked by the fact that President Obama has just taken as his new chief of staff one of the most senior bankers at J.P. Morgan Chase. It's extraordinary. That this, the ideological capture, the extent to which people in Washington became convinced, and it, maybe it was about campaign contributions. Uh, I think that's a good discussion. Perhaps it was about the revolving door. I think that's fair as well. But in terms of the ideology, in terms of the thinking of people in Washington, I, I live in Washington. I, I've testified 10 or 12 times to congressional committees on, on, on these issues. I've argued it out with other, with other experts, some of which, some of whom may or may not have had conflicts of interest. But the key thing is ideology. What do people believe about finance? What do they believe will happen if you remove the restrictions, allow the big banks to have relatively little capital, take a lot of risk, have 95% leverage in a risky world? And I, I'm not in favor of finding some new, I don't think you can find some new clever regulatory structures. I think the idea of the shadow, as John said, the shadow bankers got around the rules and constructed their own dangerous debt pyramids is exactly right. You have to understand that this is the structure of incentives going forward. These people have exactly this tendency. Very few people have got excessive power and excessive sway over public policy. And this has not been improved or addressed by the financial crisis. It remains the number one macroeconomic risk as we, as we head forward for this country. Um. I think we're, we're sort of uh, the six wise men approaching the elephant from different places, but we're looking at the same beast. And, and I think there is a fair amount of agreement between us. Uh, so let me quickly say that uh, I certainly agree that one of the big factors was uh, the incentive structures in the private financial system. Uh, the incentive to herd, the incentive to take these risks the uh, lack of appropriate risk pricing because you thought at the end of it you were too big to fail uh, or too many to fail. And that was a big, uh, big problem. Um, I would argue that, that uh, shaping some of these factors was also government policy. Uh, not just about the interventions post-crisis, but the interventions pre-crisis. Uh, whether they be government guarantees to housing, via Fannie and Freddie, or whether they be government liquidity puts uh, via the Federal Reserve System. Uh, I think government guarantees are almost, almost always mispriced, and they have two pernicious effects. Of course, one is because of the mispricing, uh, the private sector wants to take advantage of it. That's the, one, that's the thing that gives them the edge. But as important is the fact that the government is such a big entity that it coordinates the private sector. And because it coordinates the private sector, almost always it creates systemic risks. 
and that's part of the problem. So, it, I, again, I don't want to argue it was one side or the other. I don't want to say it was just the government as the right wing uh, sometimes argues. I don't want to say it was just the bankers. But I think it was a lethal combination of the two, and this is where I think the meteor an analogy is, is probably right. The one place I would, uh, I would uh, sort of uh, depart a little from, from Simon is, is on the size issue, uh, which is, uh, yes, there were plenty of large banks which got into trouble, which did terrible things, but there are plenty of small and medium-sized banks also uh, which seem to have gotten into trouble and are still in trouble with the... Uh, commercial real estate uh, lending that they have done. And uh, I think uh, what we need to think about is, is essentially the idea of too systemic to fail, whether it be because of size or it be because of, you know, there are too many banks of this kind. And uh, I think Simon repeatedly says, and I think he's absolutely right, that without discipline in the financial system, you make all the wrong decisions. Now, uh, so, so therefore, I would say there is a reasonable amount of agreement that what we need to do is think about how we can get the right incentives back in the system. Does it mean a whole set of regulations of one kind or the other? Yeah, we're going to debate that for a long time. And I think that's really what's going to be uh, the, the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we didn't hear much about uh, the Fed and the low interest rates for much of the 2000s. We, I don't think anybody mentioned the word subprime. Uh, and so uh, in, uh, it would be useful for you guys just to tell us why uh, the Fed wasn't mentioned, why subprime wasn't mentioned directly. Um, then I think uh, you might also have comments on what your colleagues on the panel said. Well, uh, I didn't mention the Fed because I, I don't think that's true. Um, I spent half of my life thinking about finance and half thinking about money. And uh, how can the Federal Reserve, so the central problem is the price of risk. This is a finance audience. We all understand this. It's not the level of interest rates. The puzzle is that, is that people were lending subprime mortgages and all sorts of stuff at very low credit spreads. Uh, that, that there was a lot of willingness to take risk. Now, what does the level of the overnight federal funds rate have to do with people's willingness to take risk? Um, maybe someday in the future someone will write down some kind of monetary economics that connects those two. I, I don't know of one. So I, 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 don't, I, I just can't understand how the Fed has something to do about that. Subprime, of course, you know, is part of this huge mess, the subprime, the Fannie and Freddie, the, 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 the whole system that set up the possibility of taking huge losses. And, and that's fine. Finance is about you know, doing stupid things and taking huge losses. But, but what made this a crisis was the externality. And I think where the public policy um, focus should be is on controlling externalities, not on making sure nobody ever loses anything. Uh, because as Raghu said, when the government tries to make sure nobody ever loses anything, we, we get into even worse problems. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I only didn't mention the Fed for lack of time, Rene. Um, look, the, the, the Greenspan put, uh, which used to be, I think, something of a humorous reference, is not funny anymore. And there, there's clearly, it's clearly become the Bernanke put in some, in some bigger sense. Um, we should talk more with John about how you, why, this, why you can or how you can or cannot put this into macro models. But if, if there is a bailout expectation of some kind, that Larry, Larry Summers said this, best statement of this, from anyone that I've seen, Larry Summers lectured to the American Economic Association in, in 2000, reflecting on the 1990s. He said a healthy financial system cannot be based on the expectation of a financial bailout. I think, unfortunately, he, he wasn't really able to follow through on, on some of those, um, I mean, some of the implications of that statement when he had an opportunity when, when he was at the White House. Um, but the broader point is that the Federal Reserve, bo both it, through Alan Greenspan's approach to regulation and deregulation and, and, his, and his view on whether there should be um, higher or even uh, moderate capital requirements in banking or in shadow banking, that was very important. And I, I think the uh, way in which the Fed responded to relatively minor financial disruptions has certainly, in combination with this particular regulatory environment, absolutely led to today's dangers. And I think the situation today is worse than it was before. I think too big to fail has become more ingrained. 
And we're edge edging towards the European situation, which if you're not familiar with it, ha they have banks, for example, in Ireland, but not only in Ireland, that have become too big to save. So those too big to save banks are banks that you want to save because you're afraid of the blast radius, the damage. But when you try to save them, you find you're taking on so much debt that you go, in the case of Ireland, from a reasonably responsible fiscal policy to a, to a fiscal situation that, that, that in, in, our, in our opinion, is not sustainable, even under the current IMF program. Right? This, this is utter and complete disaster that stares us now in, in the face. And with regard to Fannie and Freddie, I would say to everyone in the room who has ever emphasized that Fannie and Freddie had a big problem, were a problem, had a big moral hazard problem, because they were government-sponsored enterprises, you were right. Okay? I, I don't agree that they were the key mechanism, and this is, a, this is a fascinating issue, you should read Ragu's book on this. I, I don't agree that this was the primary mechanism through which subprime took off. That was, most, that was more private than Fannie and Freddie. But there's no question, Fannie and Freddie should be euthanized as soon as possible. These are very dangerous institutions. But who are today's government-sponsored enterprises? Who is backed by the, U by the U.S. Treasury implicitly? It's the largest banks in this country. It's the big, the, take the large six bank holding companies. Who in the room thinks the Goldman Sachs, if it hit a hypothetical rock, not saying they have, not saying they will, if they hit a hypothetical rock today, who thinks they could fail, go bankrupt over this weekend, unimpeded by the government process, by the kinds of interventions that John mentioned? Anyone? Nobody raised their hand. I you wish, you wish, I, you wish they could fail. Yeah, let me just have 20 seconds so we can come to a little agreement because because there's two one aspect of policy is bailing people out and I completely agree too big to fail and the feds role along with everybody else in bailing every people out is a disaster I actually think we're in a worse situation I think Simon and everybody else thinks that everybody's going to be bailed out actually in Washington I think it's going to be much harder to bail people out there the, the effort to bailing out Goldman Sachs might actually not happen and that's the worst possible situation everybody expects a bailout and then it wouldn't happen <laughs> but the original question was the Fed and the one thing I, I did say in defense of the Fed was this charge that the low level of interest rates not not its habit of bailing everything out that I think we agree on but there is this discussion did the Fed make matters worse by its low interest rate policy and that's the one where, as a macroeconomist, I just find it very hard to find any causal link between the level of interest rates and, and willingness to take risk. Just, just uh, one point of, uh, to clarify. Goldman Sachs, as I mentioned, is a bank holding company, has unfettered access to the Federal Reserve discount window. So the politics on Capitol Hill do not directly, they can indirectly, uh, Ron Paul is chair of the Monetary Policy uh, Subcommittee of House Financial Services now, so that matters. But they do not directly prevent the Federal Reserve from saving Goldman Sachs, which is, I think, what would happen. Look at the ideology of the Federal Reserve, with all due respect to those representatives of that institution in the room. The ideology of the Federal Reserve is bail out first, ask questions later. Um, on this question of uh, low interest rates and the effect on risk taking, I think first there is empirical evidence which is emerging uh, from people at the ECB and elsewhere suggesting that uh, sustained periods of low interest rates do lead to uh, more risk taking. Now what could the mechanisms be? One is an ex ante argument and the other is an ex post argument. So um, uh, think about it this way, supposing you are a pensioner right now uh, who is trying to save for retirement and you're saying I've got to put away, I, I've got to get 4% earnings. Uh, in order to have enough to live uh, comfortably, you've sort of got a rate of return target and you suddenly find short-term interest rates are down at zero. So you're basically saying, I have a fixed liability, I need to somehow boost my earnings. If I continue at this rate, I'm dead anyway. Uh, I might as well take on more risk. The standard risk-shifting arguments start playing out in these. Now, uh, you may argue, well, on net, you're going to be okay 70% of the time, 30% of the time you're going to be toast taking this kind of risk. But with the current low interest rates, they toast 100% of the time. So why not take additional risk? That's the kind of argument that you hear pension funds making. That's the kind of argument you hear uh, you know, certain, even certain industrialists making. I can't take the 0% return on my money market account. I need some return. Uh, and I'm getting negative real on money market. I'm going to move to more risk. Uh, 
The, but the second argument for why this leads to increasing risk taking is essentially very low interest rates create an enormous penalty for being liquid. Uh, basically, you're earning nothing on liquidity. So as a result, ex ante, you have very little incentive to store liquidity because you're saying when push comes to shove, the Fed is going to come in and this is the Greenspan put, flood the market with liquidity. Why do I have to remain extra liquid? Because there's no goodies available. I mean, part of the uh, reward for having a liquid balance sheet is you get fire sales in bad times. People sell assets at one tenth their price. That's the killing you make. So you keep a liquid balance sheet for that kind of thing. Now, you may argue this is not a big factor for most people, but it does affect incentives to maintain more liquidity when you know the Fed can be a reliable source of liquidity in bad times. Uh, I'm not saying this is uh, necessarily the biggest empirical factor, but certainly this is an issue one should uh, one ought to think about. On Fannie and Freddie, I, th I, th I think you, you could debate for a long time about their precise role. Part of the problem is the whole role has been obfuscated. We need much better data on what exactly they were doing uh, over the period and how much it was a response to government pressure, how much they themselves wanted to go into it in order to get higher margins on, on their activities. For example, there's, there's some talk that, oh, Countrywide wasn't involved in Fannie and Freddie's activities. There are press releases from the middle of the 1990s extolling the partnership between Countrywide and Fannie to get uh, uh, loans to low-income segments of the population. Uh, and we're talking billions of dollars. So it's, it's hard to make the case that we understand fully what these entities were doing. They certainly had a very strong incentive in Washington to try and do what Washington wanted because, again, going back to Simon's point, they enjoyed enormous subsidies from the government through the government uh, uh, put. And so I, I think uh, I can't, we can't be categorical about what their role was. There's a lot of uh, debate without data. We need much better data on what exactly they did and when. Uh, thank you, Raghu. Uh, now Myron can take a stab at the, qu at the first question. I, uh, thank you. I'm sorry. It's late. Um, the, uh, in terms of the first question and answering it, I, it might be just, I might be saying things that are redundant relative to what others have said, so please apologize. But, uh, apologize. but I, I really think that if we want to think overridingly about what the cause of the uh, crisis was, that um, I think it was basically that volatility was low over a long and extended period of time and that uh, we believe that over a period from the 70s to the 2000s, we really had had shocks, but the consequences of the shocks were not very great. I mean, we had lost, for example, $7 trillion in uh, 2000 with the uh, dot-com uh, collapse, and, uh, and uh, we had uh, felt that we had learned uh, many mechanisms to transfer uh, risk and that we had seen uh, stability in prices um, and uh, actions about great uh, moderation um, in terms of monetary policy, et cetera. And so they, with, the volatility, with the volatility being low, uh, the consequence of volatility being low is that uh, we reduce our flexibility and both our operating flexibility and our financing flexibility. So individuals around the world, uh, are not around the world, but in terms of uh, Europe and the United States, and additionally, we had uh, reduced funds insurance companies. The uh, interesting point is that when, we know in sort of finance, there's the envelope theorem, if you believe that volatility is going to be low, then, uh, the um, consequence of that is that you might want to uh, take additional risk, uh, given risk preferences. So uh, my feeling is that uh, with the volatility low, it also meant that returns on financial entities were low on their spread business. Um, and as a result, if they were going to target volatility or try to target risk, uh, to earn returns that would uh, have returns on uh, equity sufficient uh, to satisfy their investors that they would um, then be involved in uh, taking additional leverage. So we saw leverage ratios going in the banks and other financial entities from measured ra ratios for something like 15, 10 to 15 times to 40 times over this period as 
the demand or targeting of, um, of return on equity was, uh, was crucial. That also in terms of combinations of this lower volatility and the, uh, and the, um, and the idea of having uh, my views opaque accounting where it was uh, virtually impossible to uh, know either with the, uh, uh, the structures within financial entities or the um, opaque, uh, uh, sorry, or the, or the derivative books that basically we had set up just a stage when you have 40 or 45 times leverage as measured, even higher leverage, that small shocks or changes uh, could cause there to be uh, uh, large losses, which caused then the cascade that we had seen in the uh, time of the financial uh, crisis. And obviously, um, you know, regulators and, regu and uh, in general, in my view, were um, really asleep to the great buildup and risk that had built into the system, risk that had been built up conditional on that the measured risk of the previous periods actually was understated relative to what, uh, you know, expected risk uh, should be in the system. So um, I think we, in some sense, the question is, what do we, there's two worlds. One is a world in which we believe the volatility will continue to be low going forward, which means that we do reduce flexibility and we increase uh, both operating and financing flexibility. Uh, because we don't need it. On the other hand, if the world in the future is not uh, like the world that is going that we've observed currently or in recent times, then obviously what happened was a complete uh, a setup for disaster. So uh, the real question is, um, you know, what do we learn from periods of quiet volatility or quiet times or good times, and uh, to what extent, if any. Um, you know, the uh, regulatory forces or the macro forces such as the Federal Reserve actually uh, created an implicit period of uh, seemingly low volatility. And so we don't know what the natural level of volatility is in uh, society or how even uh, to consider that. But I, in my feeling, we need a lot of thinking and research on, uh, you know, the effects of volatility or uncertainty in general on behavior and how much optionality and how much uh, protection people build in, uh, not only in the financial institutions, but in uh, consumption, savings policies, and even in uh, the activities of governments. Thank you. Uh, John has 20 seconds that he wants to uh, borrow from the next question. All right. Well, I just wanted 20 seconds because Raghu, as usual, said something brilliant, but he only touched the surface. So we were arguing a little bit about the, the uh, Greenspan put, which is lowering the level of interest rates in response to crises. And, and Raghu's got a point. In some sense, low, in, low overnight rates are a subsidy to being a bank. But the new Fed is intervening directly in markets and intervening directly to attack risk premia. So if the, if the uh, commercial paper rate gets high, the Fed intervenes there. Uh, that, that is the new uh, the Bernanke put, if you will, or the, the rest of the Fed put. And that has big incentive effects because um, your fire sale is my buying opportunity. And every time the Fed props up something in bad times, there's less incentive to be the Warren Buffett, to be the, the liquid institution who sits around and waits and provides the liquidity in the bad times. So if you were sitting around and waiting for, for commercial paper rates to spike and, and buy up those deals, well, you were made a fool of. If you buy CDS coverage on a company that then gets bailed out, you were made a fool of. If you buy CDS coverage on a country in Europe that gets bailed out, you were made a fool of. So every time we stop and we go into prop up prices, which the Fed is doing, and this is way beyond interest rate policy, you, you get rid of that. You, 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 there's much less incentive to have those people be out there and be the buyers in the fire sale. But, but it's, not, <coughs> it's not just liquidity, John. It's capital as well. If you hold a lot of capital against that rainy day and the put comes in, you made a fool of there too. Yep. So why not go for as little capital as you can and juice the return on equity, as Myron just suggested? Right. And, and we're, I think, focusing Fed policy on the level of the overnight rate is, is like so 1990s. Fed policy is now about targeting every, it's mortgages, it's commercial paper, it's there, you know, every rate, in, and that's where the issue is. Okay, I'm over by 20. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, the next question has to do with the Lehman bankruptcy. And uh, the question is, given what we have learned 
uh, over the two years since the failure of Lehman, was it a mistake to let Lehman uh, fail? We will go in alphabetic order again. Uh, just to rem remind you, we have people on our webcast, webcast as well, and so make sure that you speak into the microphone. Thank you, thank you. Well, well um, yeah, because you, you know how bailing out Bear Stearns, that stopped us from having a financial crisis. <laughs> if only, you know, so I think obviously, um, the, the, painting it all on letting Lehman fail is, is uh, very short-sighted. If you go back to the, the way the things were at the time, if Lehman had been bailed out, Citi would have gone under. Uh, there was no way we could, we could have kept bailing out absolutely everything bigger and bigger. The sentiment was for these bailouts have to end sooner. Like a forest fire, the longer you keep putting it off, the, the, the bigger it is. Um, so, so if they had bailed out Lehman, do the full counterfactual. You can't just go, oh, life's hunky-dory. Well, then there's AIG, then there's Wachovia, then there's Citigroup. Something even bigger would have gone, and it would have been a worse disaster. The problem was bailing out Bear Stearns. The problem was getting and then bailing out Fannie and Freddie, and then to getting us into this too big to fail mentality in the first place. And then in that dramatic week in September, uh, I certainly don't think it helped for, for our leaders to go on TV and, and have three pages saying the world is about to end. If you, if, if you didn't know this, uh, we're not going to tell you where it is, but you can't short bank stocks this week, and we need $700 trillion billion. <laughs> we're not going to tell you what we're going to do with it. I mean, there, there, that certainly helped to get a financial crisis going. <laughs> so I think, I, I, again, I substantially agree with, with, with John, and I, I would put it this way, that if, if you ha at that moment when, when a, a big financial institution is going to fail, um, it's very scary. And I think, they, they, I think the leadership itself was scared and they were panicked and, the, and as John said, they may have, they may have uh, further exacerbated the fears. But I, I would focus on this issue, uh, the issue of size at the moment of failure. See, what John said was, if he bailed out Lehman, something even bigger would fail like Citi. Let me tell you about Citi. Citi has, an asset, has, a, has a balance sheet right now, uh, just over 13% of US GDP. That, that's a big bank. It's actually not the biggest, it was the biggest bank uh, calculated, I think, correctly at the t in 2008. It's not the biggest bank. Now it's, not, it's number three. If you go back to the, what have we gained? What, what, have we, what, have we, what are the risks that we get from having such a big bank, from having Lehman have grown so, so big and Citi and all these other, having grown so big in the past 15 years? The social benefits, to be honest, are illusory and, and I, I, not demonstrated. And, and this I get from a lot of arguing with bankers uh, in, as, in public as, as much as possible. Um, Citigroup um, was, Go back to the 19. Citigroup failed, of course, three times. It substantially failed at the end of 2008 and was bailed out. By the way, uh, it failed at the end of the 80s. It failed in 1981. 1981, it was uh, no more. It was about two and a half percent of GDP. So we, the, the, the biggest six banks today are six, have balance sheets 64 percent of GDP in, in this country. Uh, in 1995, those same six banks and the banks that, that they descended from had a balance sheet uh, around 15, 16 percent of GDP. So we've allowed these issues to become bigger, and we've allowed ourselves to, to get into this situation where, you know, as, as Raghu said uh, in his introductory remarks, small institutions can fail, and you can get, we know you can have cascading panics even among small institutions. That's what happened in the 1930s. That's why we have deposit insurance. But in addition to that problem, which is a bad problem, and which can bring us the savings and loans crisis, which was a bad crisis, we don't want to do that again, we have allowed this additional problem to develop where you, you, get, you only have bad options in mid-September. 2008. You only have the choice between very bad things and probably more disastrous things because these entities are so big and because they are very related to, to each other in, in, a, in a loose term is interconnected and we could discuss the details of what that really means if you're interested. But that's the problem. These meteors that are striking the earth are getting bigger, not through some natural process. This is not a market outcome. This is the result of a government subsidy. This is an unfair, non-transparent, and dangerous government subsidy that goes to too big to fail financial institutions. They can borrow more cheaply. Estimates vary, but we put this around 50 basis points. Again, we can debate that. Fannie and Freddie had a funding advantage of at least 25 basis points. This subsidy allows them to get bigger, helps the, the executives, arguably helps the shareholders, creates big social risks and dangers and leads us directly to further Lehman moments or worse. And worse is Ireland or Iceland or what you could see in other European countries. Uh, I think the point that's already been made is, is in September 2008, uh, you essentially had two choices. One, see most of the banking system go under and it doesn't matter where you, you 
started the process of letting people go. Uh, uh, you would have seen most of them go under because of the interconnections, because of the uncertainty about who owed how much to what, where, uh, because of the complexity of the structures they had, the difficulty of resolving them. Uh, so you could do that, or you could bail out the entire system after you got enough political capital to do it, and Lehman essentially got you that political capital because basically said, uh, you know, look what happened when we let one of these guys go. Uh, we need to save the system. So the response to Lehman was essentially guarantees for everybody, unlimited of one kind or the other, and, and the system was rescued. I think uh, it's sort of a, I'm not sure it's a useful question asking, you know, should, should we have let another go? Should we have let three more go? Uh, the truth is that's, that was a very bad place to start. Uh, and, and I think uh, going forward, we don't want any entity to be too big to fail or too systemic to fail. The question is, how do we achieve it? And Simon, I think, is very much in the forefront of the guys who says, cut these guys down to size. Cut them, make them small. And if they're smaller, they will be uh, you know, easier, uh, easier to resolve. Um, again, I think you could have reasonable debate about that. Uh, if they're smaller and take the same risks, would they be easier to resolve? If they're smaller and are more interconnected, uh, would they be easier to resolve? I think that debate can go on, but I think we're all agreed that what you want to do is try and find ways to A, if they're important, they should have bigger private buffers. They should have more capital, they should have more liquidity buffers, because that would offset some of this advantage that they get. B, you need to focus them on trying to tell you how they could be resolved. This is where I think the idea of living wills makes a lot of sense. They need simpler structures. They need far simpler structures, and that's, that's, that you, you need to give them incentives to do that rather than incentives to become more complicated. And certainly, you can use your regulatory powers to authorize or disauthorize some mergers to do that kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's possible. You can also you know, have meetings with the regulators uh, frequently. Uh, I think these, these are important uh, uh, things you need to do to try and get the, the banking sector to become uh, a little more manageable. But I think perhaps most important is you get, need to get investors in the banking system to react as the bank takes more risks. And I think what we have created is a structure, perhaps because of these too big to fail incentives, that the liability structure of the bank doesn't react. In fact, the, if anything, the equity holders cheer these, this process on and the debt holders are mute uh, and don't really worry because they know that at the end of it, somebody's going to pick up the bill. We need more classes of debt that are actually structured to fail if the bank gets into trouble and fail almost automatically. And for that, you, you need to make sure that not only is there a clear contractual agreement about what will happen to these uh, debt claims in, in a situation of distress, but you also need them to be held by non-levered entities. If they're held by levered entities, you go to get back to the same argument, we've got to bail them out because otherwise we've got panic. So how to create a system where, in fact, the private sector bears the risk and imposes penalties on the banks as they take more risk? I think that, to my mind, is a central issue we need to address. Maybe cutting them down to size may be part of it, but I think uh, it's, it's, it's part of the broader question. Uh, thank you. Um, Actually, the, uh, in terms of uh, whether we should let Lehman have failed or not, um, I think that basically the, um, we need to uh, really change the uh, bankruptcy code uh, and really work on what, it, what uh, the bankruptcy code um, implied in the case of Lehman. Uh, and we shouldn't have let Lehman fail with the bankruptcy code being what it was. In other words, uh, Lehman had an, immediate, an immense derivative book. They had over, uh, I think, over 1.8 million contracts or derivative contracts with counterparties around the world. And uh, when they went bankrupt, there was the immediate unwinds that uh, occurred under the bankruptcy code, which completely froze the system. The system cannot handle 1.8 million uh, contracts uh, that are global uh, instantaneously, and this uh, froze the entire system that led to uh, a cascade effect among other counterparties and I think uh,
caused lots of the difficulties with regard to, um, uh, subsequently with regard to AIG and, uh, and uh, others of uh, the counter, uh, other of the banks such as Morgan Stanley and Goldman, um, that resulted in huge amounts of collateral dumping into the system as entities that Lehman had borrowed from uh, to finance its derivative positions uh, had to uh, actually figure out what they had and what they, how they can protect themselves and obviously going to cash and forgetting the Lehman estate was the uh, biggest part of it. So it was very tough to value the claims. We need a lot of study in the, in the uh, profession to really understand the implications of allowing something to collapse immediately uh, when you have a, a gigantic system that's interconnected. So there was a uh, cause a run on Lehman, and uh, causing the run on Lehman then caused the run on lots of other financial entities. Things that John had talked about as well, or they're obviously uh, going to uh, what the government did subsequent to Lehman, so it's all interrelated in causing there to be more of a panic and more collapse within the system. So we have to understand that uh, we have to think that the bankruptcy system could work, but we have to understand that we need uh, some type of timeout or some type of, of plan when some entity such as Lehman goes bankrupt before we allow it to go bankrupt. And uh, I think if they had uh, caused uh, Lehman to go bankrupt, had the bankruptcy code said in a bankruptcy that we uh, continue to have the derivative book in place uh, for a period of time, to, and a two-way mark-to-market would continue to exist over that period of time so that the, the unwinding process could have been handled in a uh, time frame that was a period of uh, several weeks or months maybe uh, with adequate margin and mark-to-market continuing the system might not have collapsed. But the end result of all my statements is that basically we have to try to have uh, movement to clearing corporations so that the instantaneous unwinds are handled efficiently and don't bring, in the, in the Lehman case, if we had clearing corporations, then it would be uh, uh, much easier uh, to handle the unwind process than we have to think about is the clearing corporation process for unwinds uh, superior to or economically uh, inferior to uh, having uh, a stay period in a way of having adequate unwinds and, uh, and margin and mark-to-market processes. I think the current rules uh, which uh, allow for non-corporate, uh, for commercial exemption from requiring uh, margin or mark-to-market is actually setting up a stage for an additional disaster going forward because uh, it's a big hole in the system and uh, no leverage controls, no, nothing associated with what a company that is called a commercial entity can do that could bring the entire system down on its own in the future. So I think we have to really, uh, and I think that the uh, Dodd-Frank bill, which we'll talk about I guess in a moment or two, which has, uh, 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 is going to let the FDIC take over the liquidation is a disaster, um, and the bailout fund, even though we said no bailouts, we have a bailout fund uh, that's going to tax other financial entities that uh, basically allowing for the uh, government to take over uh, and liquidate firms that are presumably systemically um, risky at a particular moment in time will be Lehman uh, squared or uh, to the nth power uh, because it'll uh, cause such a run on the system. It's a black hole. We never test it to, uh, at least if we allow commercial parties to have a time to settle their own contracts efficiently, we have a chance the system will continue. If we pass everything over to the government to do it, uh, I think the probability is near zero that it'll be able to uh, sustain itself and be able to, uh, to unwind uh, in a reasonable way. Thank you, Myron. Uh, indeed, the next uh, question has to do with uh, Dodd-Frank, but we had, we had not talked about derivatives very much until uh, your answer. Uh, and, uh, among the causes of the crisis that were not discussed, 
or causes that people have talked about. Uh, one of them is, uh, is the role of derivatives. And so I wanted to give a brief chance to the three other members of the panel to tell us their take on uh, the role of derivatives. And then we'll uh, move straight on to uh, my question about Dodd-Frank, which is whether it reduced or increased systemic risk. Uh, by now you know Myron's position, but I'm sure we will elaborate on it. So derivatives. If, if Derivatives are great things and, and can be misused. I mean, the, the popular view, oh, derivatives caused their, what did Warren Buffett call them, uh, engines of financial destruction before he started writing put options like crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, not, there is, that's not the issue. I, I think Myron brought up the issue, which isn't the derivative as contract, but how the derivative is treated in bankruptcy. And the surprising thing to me of the layman bankruptcy the things that were were said were going to be a problem of bankruptcies, oh, they'll, they'll lose money and then the other people will go bankrupt and there'll be a chain of bankruptcies. That didn't happen. We found out all sorts of sand in the gears of bankruptcy code, which I didn't know about. For example, those, so those of you who don't know the detail, what mine was referring to is when a company goes bankrupt, if I, if I have offsetting derivatives with Simon and Raghu, I don't just say, hey, Simon, go, go talk to Raghu, he'll pay you back. Instead, both of them get made whole at opposite ends of the bid-ask spread, and, and that's a disaster if you have to do it overnight. Well, we can fix that. We got $700 billion to spend and, and some lawyers, you know, why don't we fix the problems in the bankruptcy code? Uh, so der derivatives, like these other contracts that cause problems, that, there was runs. Well, you get runs when there are run-prone contracts, but contracts aren't necessarily run-prone. You can fix the features of contracts that make them run-prone. What made derivatives run-prone was this, this system was actually there to make them less run-prone so that each individual felt, oh, I could get out, but, but then since it's such a mess in bankruptcy and there may not be enough money, it turns it into something run-prone. The big picture is the, the problems of the Lehman bankruptcy can be fixed, and maybe we ought to try doing that. So, so, so here, here I disagree uh, with, with John and Myron. Not for the United States. I agree, changing the bankruptcy code makes a lot of sense, and, and I think John's proposals and Myron's ideas would be a good place to start. But, but here's the problem. Banking today, and Myron mentioned this, the banks today, the kind of banking we care about, the kind of banking that can have big global impacts, is global banking. Citigroup does uh, banks, uh, in over, provides banking services in over 100 countries, Goldman Sachs brags about uh, doing business in more than 90 dialects. Lehman, of the 1.2 million contracts, uh, open derivative contracts Lehman had when it failed, at least 600,000 were in London. So you need, think very carefully about this, okay? You need a global solution. You need either an integrated bankruptcy code, which is I think what the, these two gentlemen are proposing, fine with me if you can get it, or more likely you need an, an integrated single joint resolution mechanism that include, could include these principles or some other principles. That's an intergovernmental agreement. What are the odds that you can get such an intergovernmental agreement, a cross-border resolution mechanism that would deal with these complex issues that are central to the size of the, of the blast radius you're getting for these financial failures? What is the probability that you can get such an agreement over the next 20 years? It's zero. It's a zero probability, or as close to zero as anything is zero probability. You, if you don't believe me, go talk to the G20 deputies, the guys who organize this, the summits you read about. I, I talk to them. I ask them this question. They don't want to do it. They do not want to tie their hands. They do not want, if you talk, to, maybe they should. Maybe the, the other speakers are absolutely right on this. I, I don't have a problem with that thinking. But the, I can tell you, from talking to the people who are in charge of all the other countries that would be involved in this, they will not agree to any kind of convergence in legal systems or bankruptcy code, that's for sure. And they will not agree to any kind of cross-border resolution mechanism. The Eurozone doesn't even have one. After 10 years of really obvious problems emerging out of this and the IMF berating them at every opportunity on this. That's not true because is this global? Okay. Oh. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. That when, it's when it's commercially in people's interest to do something, they will do it. And is that, for example, the uh, agreements in which uh, uh, swaps and other types of derivative contracts were written ha is a global framework. Uh, Lehman borrowed on is the contracts from banks in Japan and uh, Europe, etc. So it's a global system. Um, and uh, I agree that uh, 
we were talking about the bankruptcy rules. I was, didn't mean it for a specific country. I was sort of meaning it as a global system of really understanding the economics of what happens in failure. I, I agree with all of that, Myron, but uh, bankruptcy code surely, uh, or the resolution mechanism, is, an, is a pre-commitment on the part of all uh, responsible parties, including governments who have potential discretion, not to take discretionary action, but to follow pre-specified rules that make sense ex ante. But there's a commitment problem, and that, I'm telling you if, you, if you talk to the government officials, maybe they're wrong, maybe they're deluded, maybe, fine. But they will not agree for 20 years. For the foreseeable future, you will not get a sufficient agreement on a framework here, which means, relative to your point about volatility, Myron, which I think is the essence of this, we are in a high volatility world because in these stress scenarios, you don't have a way to implement failure in an organized, pre-specified way so people know what they're going to get. You're going to have a lot of discretion with all the adverse effects that that brings, which John has been stressing. I agree that with Simon that it's going to be very hard to get an international agreement. But I think the reason is really because of uh, difficulties of determining burden sharing. If you fail one of these institutions, who's going to pay the losses? Is it going to be the big pocket? Is it going to be a small pocket? How much relative responsibility do they bear? It's just impossible to write this down. And because we're talking about transfers of wealth, uh, you're not going to get exante agreements on this, which is why I, I agree totally that this is, this is a non-starter. Uh, on, on international bankruptcy rules. I do think that what we will see is increasingly uh, international banks which uh, essentially have separately incorporated subsidiaries across countries and regulatory authorities will pay far more attention to the inter-entity flows than they have so far and there will be a lot of regulation of those flows. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, uh, Lehman, when it failed, there's a massive across-the-world attempt to draw Lehman funds which were in different countries back into the UK or the US so that US assets or UK assets would be protected, leaving the shell in other countries. And of course, central banks, uh, some of them got wise to this, some of them were told by Lehman employees, this is going on, stop us from sending it back. Uh, and, and you know, across the world you had uh, uh, things like this happening. Uh, the point is we have a terrible system right now, we need to figure out ways to make it better. Uh, one point on the derivatives, uh, I do think the big issue there is the fact that in an attempt to make the derivatives much more run-proof, the point that, uh, that John was making, uh, the fact that uh, you know, counterparties uh, to Lehman can go and set up contracts separately and are paid to set up those contracts separately can create enormous losses for Lehman, but therefore other parties who are junior in the structure, ordinary unsecured debt, or people who've put their money with Lehman in brokerage accounts, they now fear there's going to be a tremendous hit from the derivatives, and therefore they run. So not only are the derivatives running because they're not sure of how this is going to be dealt with in bankruptcy, but everybody else because they know there's a huge chunk which stands ahead of them. Just to give you an order of magnitude, if uh, JP Morgan, according to some estimates, has 80 trillion of gross derivatives, and I know this, these numbers uh, get blown up a little bit, Say it was 80 trillion, and say the transaction costs of setting up, and you're talking about gross numbers, of setting up the contracts once again are 1%. You're talking of an immediate loss in bankruptcy of 800 billion. That's a huge number. And if I were, a, uh, you know, I thought there was a hint of this, I would run for my money no matter where I was on the priority structure for, uh, for JP Morgan. All right. One other uh, point on the derivatives is that. Um, the posting of collateral uh, and the bankruptcy rules, again, make it that you can seize collateral in the event of a bankruptcy of a counterparty. Uh, that meant that uh, Goldman didn't have to worry about, uh, say, AIG's posting of collateral and because and it, ha it had its money and it was uh, other than daylight risk or overnight risk um, and other counterparties as well. If you don't have, if therefore they had, uh, they didn't have to have responsibility or worry about the risk of the uh, of the underlying counterparty uh, that they were uh, engaging in the contract structures with um, going bankrupt at least at, at the margin, and so it's the same thing as debt contracts. It's it's, it's like um, if it's the case that uh, I can borrow and. Uh, and I have um, uh, from a person, and, and that person continues to post 
a collateral with me and I can seize it at any time, then I'm indifferent, uh, theoretically, at least, uh, other than for small losses for that party's uh, uh, demise. So I think that maybe it would be wise, again, just in, this is all needs study. I just, it needs really in-depth thinking. Uh, but it might be wise that for dealers and banks uh, don't get exemption, that if the collateral could be seized or as a general creditor as opposed to getting high, first priority in the derivative market. And just that needs study. Maybe for outside counterparts who don't, who want just the derivative contract or the, what the derivative contract offers, they can be exempt, okay, from that clawback requirement. But if the banks themselves know that their counterparties are weak, then they're not going to engage in derivative contracts with them or are going to restrict that form of leverage. So we have to have thinking about who's responsible or who has responsibilities for losses in the system. They're just an idea to think about. Thank you. We now move to uh, Dodd Frank. I will leave some time at the end for questions from the audience. I just wanted to say one last word on collateral because we got off into this sort of technical financy thing about treatment of, of, of uh, derivatives in, in bankruptcy and so forth. But we need to restate the, the big picture that derivatives are great. Uh, credit default swaps are great. If you try to ban credit default swaps, well, people will just try to short sell bonds, which is functionally the same thing and much more complicated. Uh, being able to buy insurance against bonds is great. That's what credit default swaps do. Um, if you ban people, who don't have the underlying bond, you destroy liquidity in the market. We're all here for liquidity. Mortgage-backed securities are great. The, the ideal financial system, your mortgage, goes into a mortgage-backed security that's held in long-only form in someone else's pension fund, not, not in a highly fragile institution. That's like a narrow bank without all the monitoring problems of, of Citigroup. That's great, too. So I just wanted to say rah-rah for derivatives before we move on to... <laughs> Dodd-Frank. Now, Dodd-Frank, uh, um, the question it was, uh, has Dodd-Frank reduced or increased systemic risk? I'll go on, increased. Uh, I actually think it's, it's kind of sad what happened the minute Dodd-Frank passed, as, as far as I can tell. The discussion sort of ended, and we have this problem in this country that the laws aren't really laws. The laws are just authority to write regulations. So instead of discussing what's going to be in the law, it all kind of went into the basements where the regulations are being drafted. And, and even among academics, we were having wonderful arguments and discussions a year ago about deep principles and the policy sphere and the, the blogosphere and the op-ed sphere was talking about basic principles and then the law got passed and, and that all sort of stopped, which is sad. So let me remind you the big principles that we need to go back and start thinking of and th that I think Dodd-Frank missed on. The basic structure of Dodd, the first thing you have to address is moral hazard and too big to fail. The basic structure of Dodd-Frank is that there's going to be regulation to stop people from taking risks and then resolution authority if they get into trouble. Now, the nature of the resolution authority is, is essentially no rules, lots of discretion, uh, which we've known for hundreds of years is not a great system. Uh, because if you put Simon and me in an office it's Sunday night and Goldman Sachs is about to go under, we're going to bail it out. We're going to come out bloody and we're going to fight a while, but nobody in this room has the spine, if they have the authority to bail out Goldman Sachs, to not, to not let it happen. And okay, so they're putting in rules that say uh, you have to make the creditors take losses and we're going to be tough and so forth. But what does systemic mean if not keeping creditors from taking losses? It's got to be arbitrary if, if that's the idea. So given that you're going to be this is too big to fail as enshrined, now what are the incentives for the banks? Be as big, as opaque, as global, as difficult to fail as humanly possible, and that way you have the government's put. So the, the too big to fail, the, 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 having the government stuck the way they were with, with Lehman and, and having no choice but to bail out is there enshrined. The incentives for the banks to be all this needless global and interconnected and systemically dangerous is there. And then the other idea is, okay, well, given that's all there, we'll try to regulate them and keep them from taking risks. Um, as one sense of how well that's going to work, uh, right after the, in the years after, we've had several years since the financial crisis, the European banks have all been investing in Greek and Irish bonds without any particular capital requirements or regulators telling them this was a bad idea. It's sovereign risk, it's okay. Well, boom. 
That's so plain vanilla. They couldn't see that one coming. Good luck. We're going to look over the Citibank's books and see that the uh, value at risk calculation in some hedge fund in Singapore is inappropriate. The second part that both academics and, and the legislation failed on is what does systemic mean anyway? We keep using this word. I have no idea what it means. Is it too big to fail, too interconnected to fail? What does systemic mean? And in the, the discussion seemed to have gotten worse, if anything. Lots of people simply think, well, systemic is any big institution failing. Some people think it means, well, it's the psychology of failure is bad and the government has to stop that from happening. At least we were beginning to have discussions. I have a view of what systemic means. It means run-prone contracts with externalities that have to be minimized where possible, and where not possible, you've got to regulate institutions that can, inst that can issue run-prone uh, securities. So, but <coughs> that discussion seems to have vanished. Nowhere in Dodd-Frank is systemic risk defined. There's who gets determined systemic risk, but if, if the Financial Oversight Council decides that Simon Johnson poses a systemic risk to the U.S. government, boom, he's gone. There's, there's, no, there's no definition of what is not systemic. You can't fight it in court. You can't say, here's what the definition of systemic risk is. I don't, so I, I mean, no, that's not in there. Academically as well, so, you know, what's the right regulatory response? We were starting to have an interesting question whether what stopped the run was recapitalizing the banks or guaranteeing all their debts. And that's, that was a fun argument for about a year, and, and it seems to have died off, but that still is the central argument. Uh, did giving them more capital let them start lending again, or did they just blow all the extra capital on dividends, bonuses, and they weren't undercapitalized anyway? Well, certainly for, the regular, for how we respond to crises, that would be an interesting thing to know. The big picture items got lost in the regulation. Uh, everybody says there's too much leverage, there's too much debt. We want the banks to hold more capital. Well, one of the big reasons banks want to be more leveraged is there's a tax deductibility of debt and not for equity. So we're in this insane thing that the big system subsidizes debt and then we try to regulate them not to have debt. This is like our energy policy where we subsidize, uh, we subsidize oil production and then we subsidize electric cars. I mean, make up your mind. The number one thing you can do if you want banks to hold more capital is to stop subsidizing debt. And then we can talk about the capital requirements. But that kind of big picture, let's work on the contractual space, got lost in this, well, we'll just write thousands of regulations. Um, and the last thing that, that I, I think got, that it, it, all of our discussions were about how we need systemically focused regulation, not focused on individual institutions. And that seems to have gone away, along with, with really serious discussion about what systemic means in the first place. Now we're just worried about keeping individual banks. Uh, so Raghu, for example, talked about having different classes of, of debt that looks like equity. I, I, I have a fun argument with him, why not just call it equity and make it equity? But that discussion kind of got lost from the, from the policy sphere. Shouldn't just banks have lots more equity? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, in, in, so, for example, in the, one of the recent uh, things that happened out of the regulations was money market funds were, were told they have to ha hold more short-term debt. Well, that makes the individual money market fund look, look better, but of course you have now an artificial demand for more short-term debt. And I thought we were trying to squeeze short-term debt out of the system. Well, that's the natural problem when you start regulations. You lose this systemic fo focus, and instead you're just trying to go back and, and regulate individual ones. And last, um, we lost the vision. Uh, I have this beautiful vision of a financial system. Let's bring back the, the, the mortgage-backed security. Let's have sort of narrow banks that, that hold risks without, uh, without, making them, um, w without making those risks systemic dangers or run prone. Uh, let's, ha let's have smaller banks where there have to be commercial banks. We're heading instead towards a system of large government-guaranteed international, very political, uh, banks are going to be running the whole financial system, uh, and that's a, that's a very unfortunate direction to go because a government-run banking system, a government-guaranteed banking system eventually becomes a, a, a not innovative, not competitive, and, and not, not very useful banking system. Okay, enough. Thanks. Uh, on, on the substance, um, I think the situation is much worse than what John just said. On the process, I'm a little more optimistic. Look, as John said to you very clearly, there's two issues here, regulation and, and resolution mechanism. Again, there is no cross-border resolution mechanism today. 
There's nothing in Dodd-Frank, nor could there be anything in Dodd-Frank, it's just US legislation. There will not be such a mechanism for the next 20 years. We'll see if any private contracts can come in and, and supplant that. I'm highly skeptical. So it's just not there. Look at the statements, look at the strategy of Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. He has a big global bank. He says very clearly and repeatedly he wants to get bigger. He wants to become more global. He thinks that's the outcome of an ordinary market process. It's not. He's taking advantage of a huge, unfair, non-transparent, and dangerous government subsidy. This should be stopped. Regulation will not stop it. Look, George Stigler, if he were with us today, I think would recognize what we're looking at, but would be shocked by the extent to which regulatory capture has become a first order macroeconomic importance. Because what the banks and the top bankers, and again, I'm not anti-financial sector, I'm not anti-derivatives. If you hold enough capital against those positions, that's fine. I'm concerned about the excessive power of the largest global banks. And as John said, these are effectively, implicitly government guaranteed and government run, which has many problems, particularly in this form. They get the upside. They get to help tweak the, move the rules so they get the return on equity they want and persuade people, or maybe fool themselves, point Rene's been making, could be. They fool themselves, they fool you into thinking it's a low volatility environment. They get great returns, great upside. Who gets the downside? The worst of our problems is not too big to fail. It's too big to save. These financial institutions will get bigger. The, the big six that's now, that are now 64% of GDP, they were 55% at the end of 2006 before the crisis started. They've gotten bigger as a result of all these changes, and they want to get even bigger, and they have a funding advantage. And, you know, Raghu has outlined some market mechanisms that might help rein them in, but I don't see those in play right now. I think they're, they're actually becoming more leveraged. And, and the, the one place in which I would be somewhat more optimistic than John is on the process, because I don't think this is over. I don't think Dodd-Frank is the end of the process. I think a lot more people are getting involved. I think a lot of people in this room are in this room because they want to get involved, because they don't think it makes sense, either the legislation or Basel III or other pieces. And particularly the key point is equity, the lack of equity in our financial system. Why do we run a system that is 90, 95% debt when it's demonstrated itself to be highly risky, irrespective of what they believe or you believe or anyone else believes at a certain point in time? The, um, the paper that I recommend to all of you to read um, is by, on, on this exact topic, is by Anat Admati, Peter Damaso, Martin Helvig, and Paul Fleiderer, asking the question, it's called Fallacies, Irrelevant Facts and Myths in the Discussion of Capital Regulation, Why Bank Equity is Not Expensive. This is the key issue. We should be, and Gene Farmer said, said it recently, said it repeatedly, we should have equity in our bank, banking system around 40%. I, I agree with that. 40, 50% strikes me as being most reasonable given the structures that we've seen, given the way in which the system operates. And the Admati et al. paper asked the question, what are the benefits to, being, to having a financial system that is so highly leveraged relative to the costs? That's a great question. That's a research question of first order importance. And I think the, the, you should go through that paper carefully. The evidence is that as, as they see it and as I read it is the cost to having big banks with this amount of leverage are huge. And, and the benefits at the margin, the benefits of moving the banks in this bigger size and the more leveraged size are very small from a social point of view. And we have to fix that. And we have to fix that with, in ways that aren't subject to regulatory capture. It's got to be very simple. It's got to be capital requirements. It's got to be very transparent. You, the ability of these people to gain the system without question is, is incredible. So you have to think about that. But you can't just say, let the market decide, because the, the market here is going to favor the government subsidies, which these guys can extract because they're so powerful politically. That's Stigler. I think this is George Stigler, front and center on this issue. I'm a little more optimistic than both Simon and, uh, and uh, John. I mean, there are lots of problems with Dodd-Frank. It uh, clearly doesn't address the housing market. That's kicked down the road for some other government to address. It's probably not going to get addressed before we have some stability in the financial sector. Uh, doesn't address the shadow banking system to a large extent. Yes, there's issues of bringing some of the entities in the shadow banking system, calling them systemic players and bringing them under regulation. But to a large extent, it leaves them out. 
And third, it leaves monetary policy out, which I think has been a big factor in financial sector risk. So uh, I think there are big issues it doesn't tackle. However, if you, if you listed the list of issues you wanted uh, regulatory reform to tackle, what would they be? You'd want to start first with incentives, get the incentives inside the system right. And they make some attempts to try and go towards that. Um, they try and talk about the kinds of compensation structures as banks. There's not a lot written. And one of the points about making comments about Dodd-Frank is we don't know what Dodd-Frank is. A whole lot of studies to be done, a whole lot of regulations to be implemented. It's going to take time. So uh, uh, we, we need to hold our, our, our uh, uh, breath till, till it actually happens. But, but certainly they've started talking about it. I think we need more. Uh, and uh, uh, I think at, at least we've made a beginning. We haven't talked as much about guarantees. I think part of the way incentives are screwed up is because of liquidity guarantees, because of deposit insurance guarantees, and, and, and I think Dodd-Frank hasn't done much on that, but that's something we need to talk more about. Second, it talks about buffers. And, and here I, I part uh, a little bit with Simon, uh, uh, but those who want us to go back to Modigliani Miller and essentially say the only benefit of debt is a tax advantage. Well, that's, we're not talking about long-term debt. If the only benefit was a tax advantage, uh, financial firms could finance with long-term debt and get that tax advantage. What they're doing is financing with very short-term, effectively runnable, often secured debt. That's what creates the financial fragility. And I think taxes have a minor role to play in that particular issue. Um, I do think there is a rationale for that. I, th I think even uninsured entities, entities that don't have the deposit insurance put, do go out and lever up. Uh, hedge funds, for example, uh, uh, where tax advantages are relatively minor. Myron can speak more about this, of course. But also, uh, I, I think there is a definite advantage, uh, cost-wise, to short-term levered financing. And we have to recognize this. Just saying that this doesn't exist, I think, is just uh, evading the whole policy debate. The policy debate is how do we trade off the costs of requiring more capital right, against the benefits in terms of financial stability? If we ignore the fact that requiring more capital will, in fact, be costly, we're going to be ignored by the whole policy establishment for good reason, because we're not tackling the central issue, uh, which is that leverage is attractive. Myron made the point earlier how leverage uh, various forms it was attractive, but that is a central point in my view. And this is where I think some of the innovations that people have, talking, have been talking about, for example, the Squam Lake Group, talking about COCOs, uh, convertible, contingent convertibles, are trying to bring some financial thinking into this, saying, how about an instrument which is debt most of the time, and therefore gives you some of the disciplining, low-cost benefits of debt but when push comes to shove, we'll give you that buffer because it converts to equity. We need to think more about this, and I'm glad that the, the, the uh, people thinking about reform are thinking about this in a big way. A resolution authority we've talked about, I would say uh, there are two issues I, I, I want to end with. Uh, one is how much do we want to regulate? I mean, there's one school of thought which says, let's create these narrow banks. Let's create these areas of light, which we regulate very firmly and let all the garbage go into the dark where we don't even look. I think that's a very bad idea. I think the problem with sending it all into the dark is it comes back to haunt the light in times of trouble. That's exactly what we saw this time around. We paid attention to the banks, didn't pay attention to the investment banks, got problems coming from there into the system. So that would suggest that we want more uniform regulation, at least to a certain extent, across the system. But Saying that, I also feel queasy, because we know that you know, the regulated entities got into trouble. Often, regulation tends to coordinate. Why did so many people buy subprime AAA rated mortgage-backed securities? Because they had a very, high, very low capital load on them. That was regulation. Because we saw that capital load, we went in in a big way, because the risk-return trade-off for us looked very healthy. So, Regulation tends to coordinate. At the same time, having areas which are regulated and areas which are unregulated, to me, is also a bad idea. What's the compromise? Light regulation across the board, but encourage variety. I think variety helped us in this crisis. Uh, there were uh, the Warren Buffetts of the world, the Black Rocks of the world, which were willing to pick up some of the pieces in bad times. We need more of those, uh, uh, those entities uh, to exist. So uh, my sense is, uh, we, we, we have made some progress, 
we could have gone the other way. I think one of the good things that we should be celebrating is that we haven't come out of this saying the financial sector is terrible, we need to reduce it uh, to nothing. Uh, that, to my mind, is good. Uh, I think the point that, that uh, John made about derivatives are a good thing when used appropriately. So what we need is reform which moves us towards using finance appropriately rather than destroying finance. We made some steps, we need to make far more. Uh, hopefully, as Simon said, this is an evolutionary process and the debate will move us in the right direction. Sorry for sounding Panglossian. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we enjoy it. Um, yeah, I think that in my trying to read the Dodd-Frank bill, which uh, I had a completely black hair before I started and so came a little bit white thereafter. Um, you know, I, it, it, it is really a mess to read. I mean, if we had to have 2,100 pages of a bill, uh, which is just a framework for uh, saving our financial system or, or uh, creating a financial system that's going to lead us into the re for the rest of the century, I was shocked to think that we had waited this long. If we needed 2,100 pages or so, why didn't we have changed things beforehand? Um, you know, it's a massive bill, and as was stated by others uh, here, that there is virtually no regulations that was, uh, the, the bill didn't make the rules, it passed it on to the regulators to make the real rules in the system. And I think, as uh, others have said, there's about 70 studies that have to be done in a very short period of time. Uh, so it really is just a framework, and we will see what happens uh, going forward. If I were uh, and just uh, actually um, agreeing with uh, what has already been said, if I think what should have been done is really uh, try to think about uh, making uh, financial institu institutions sound to be able to handle shocks in the system and, um, and think about the idea of what is going back to sort of basic finance and trying to ask questions about what, are, what is prudent prudent finance, what is prudent leverage, what is a prudent capital structure, how we should think about that, and how we should engage in the idea of thinking about uh, what does it mean when we have uh, uh, no firm is too big to fail. So making financial institutions sound or thinking about how a framework for making them sound would be great. And as I talked about earlier, a second point that I would have liked to have seen is thinking about moder modernization of the corporate of uh, the system of failure under the bankruptcy rules, under our regulatory rules. Um, you know, we've had many and myriad innovations over the last 20 or 30 years, and you know, the way we tend to think about uh, corporate failure has been done in a hodgepodge uh, way by having um, a system that relies on precedent without any real thinking about what would happen if many failed at the same time. So I think we have to uh, really worry about that. I also think that we have to think about, we should have thought about, and we didn't, is the idea of uh, streamlining the regulatory framework. If we're going to have regulatory capture, um, then the idea is that we have too many regulatory agencies. Should we actually cut back on the amount of regulation? Uh, you know, why is it, for example, insurance companies can only buy uh, uh, certain uh, quality bonds, which create then a uh, cascade effect to think about uh, designing things for them that meet the regulatory uh, rules. The issue of accountability for regulators, you know, I'd like to have seen the bill said, if regulators are going to regulate, we should have some form of accountability in the system. You know, instead of saying, oh, it's someone else's fault, you know, or it's not my fault, it's those hedge fund guys who weren't even involved in this thing, it's their fault, or speculators, um, et cetera. So I think a system of accountability uh, would be good and streamlining would be good. This should have been an opportunity to say, do we have too many, as opposed to now having many more regulatory agencies. Um, the other area is mark to market. Um, it's pathetic and stupid to think that we should be debating whether you should mark to market for a financial institution. Uh, hedge funds mark to market every day. 
you know, and other entities mark to market every day. But to have all this regulatory accounting where you can hold to maturity or hold for investment or hold for resale and mark to market only a small part of your balance sheet uh, it does, and liabilities doesn't make any sense. If you had the idea of mark to market, at least uh, opacity would disappear. And what we've done is created even greater opacity currently with the uh, evolution away from any form, really, of uh, mark to market. Take stable value products that were referred to. I mean, the idea of having a money market fund that promises to give you a dollar back and yet invest in risky loans uh, is, a, is what probably one is going to fail. Or an insurance company that promises you that you will, should receive the max of the return on equities or, or your money back plus 3% is doomed to fail. I mean, you know, it's impossible. Um, so I think that a stable value products, how we mark to market, this, the debate, that should have been a primary part of creating the transparency necessary so other entities can know what's happening. I think that if you look at the hedge fund sphere uh, after uh, you know, long term and, and others, that the leverage ratios, and they make good money, they're attracting capital, have been about four to one or five to one in the spread business. Uh, they borrow from banks, and they have to post collateral and mark to market with banks all the time. Banks are always monitoring the hedge funds and demanding that they liquidate positions or get out. But who's doing it for the banks? You know, the banks, banks have this club. They don't, uh, they don't understand, the officers and senior people don't understand modern finance. Uh, they don't understand mar mar market principles, the money mar management principles. Uh, they're opaque, 41 leverage, as I said, and the leverage is even greater now. It's amazing. You look at the leverage in the banking system now and really try to look at it, you'd be shocked. I mean, I, you probably aren't because you've done it, but. Uh, and the innovation in the banks and the, and the compensation systems and the way the banks work is they're out of control. The idea that the senior management, an organization works as a horizontal and a vertical. If the vertical doesn't understand what the horizontals are doing, there's no way to run the organization. So the basic part is innovation has far exceeded the infrastructure to control it. And how do you deal with that situation? in financial entities. How do you make it that the innovation doesn't go too far or at least study the economics of when infrastructure should support innovation? The flash crash is an illustration of that. You've got tremendous amounts of innovation and no infrastructure to understand what's happening. So the co who bears those costs? And it's because of the too big to fail or the fact that you have the support. Dodd-Frank is still gonna have the same things. In fact, it's even worse. Because now you not only have to worry about yourself failing, you have to worry about everyone else failing in this system. Uh, I think that would be a way for the private sector to start monitoring the regulators and see whether they're doing their jobs. And somebody could start asking questions. Okay, so 30% or 40% of banking assets are now real estate. Uh, do we start worrying about it? I mean, some of these numbers just don't make uh, the light. And of course, the cross exposures in this kind of asset, that kind of asset. This is something the Office of Financial Research, if it could uh, pop make public a lot of the data it's gathering in a way that can be read without the entities who are giving the figuring that, that out is, is that many people in the room will contribute to that. Raghu, that's not going to nailed this problem in 2004-2005. You told the, everyone the details here, and you should all see the movie Inside Job, where they interview Raghu on this clear and I think completely accurate presentation. And, and what did Larry Summers call you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the Wall Street that, that, that uh, Larry said that Raghu was a Luddite and didn't understand and, didn't un and was standing in the way of, of economic progress. That's the political pushback that the Office of Financial Research will encounter every time you try to rein in risk, Raghu. We did come to one remarkable, I think, piece of agreement, that the poison in the system is short-term debt. Um, whether it's poison in the system because of a tax deduction, there's a lot of regulatory preference for short-term debt as an asset, which creates then the artificially low price, which makes, that's one of the reasons uh, people like it. 
So why aren't we squeezing short-term debt out of the system to the minimal amount possible? That seems like the one big picture that got lost in 10,000 pages of regulation about exactly how much risk what bank can take. Okay, we'll turn to the last question. We'll be brief in our answers so that we have uh, 15 minutes of questions from the audience. Uh, and so just uh, now the question one, is the crisis over? That's a yes or no. Uh, <laughs> And if it is, how likely is it that we will ex experience another crisis within 10 years? That's a number. And the last part we have already answered. So let's, uh, let's try to, to be brief, but uh, John, you start. Uh, yes, so the financial crisis is turmoil in short-term debt markets, huge spreads, um, you run, the run is over, that's over, short-term debt markets are working. But uh, goodbye financial crisis, hello sovereign debt crisis. Um, if we face a danger in the future, that's I think the one we face. To, to summarize Simon Johnson, we can be Iceland. Uh, Europe is already uh, implicitly bailing out its banks. And what's going on here is Europe is, is bailing out the countries so that the countries will bail out the banks. Um, everybody knows the state of the US, California and Illinois could be our Greece and Portugal. Uh, read your Karn, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff. Uh, what happens after a financial crisis is the sovereign debt crisis. Doesn't have to happen, uh, but I, uh, that's the big danger, especially given uh, the extent to which uh, banks and other whatever systemically important is, uh, which I think means everybody um, is now invested in, in sovereign debt. And that's, that's why defining systemically important is, is crucial. If California is gonna default, is our government going to decide that that's a systemic risk just because people are going to lose some money? Anyway, uh, the, the, the crisis, I, the thing to watch for, I think, is the, the sovereign debt crisis. The crisis is not over. Talk to people in Portugal, Spain, other parts of the Eurozone as we move forward. Talk to people at the local state level in the United States in 2011. Watch the development of a smaller, more compact, more Germanic Eurozone. Look at how the financial market attention shifts to other industrialized countries with large amounts of debt outstanding like the United States. And ask the question, for how long does the US dollar remain the safe haven? I hate to break this to you if you didn't already hear it, but the age of American predominance is over. Asia has risen. The Chinese renminbi will be a reserve currency within two decades, I would predict. The idea that we can have a great bipartisan consensus on a big deficit increase under these current circumstances is, is quite extraordinary. The, the issue for the financial markets going forward is not, can you agree to put more debt out there? The issue is, can you run fiscal austerity in the stress scenario? And my read of Washington politics is, we cannot. We are vulnerable, and assuming that we will always be the safe haven, that people will always flock to the dollar when the pressure is on is a fundamental mistake and a complete misreading of our current circumstances and world financial history. Um, <laughs> that was a pretty strong statement. Uh, first, uh, 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 just uh, to lighten that, that one, on the OFR, I, I think the, the point wasn't, I wasn't arguing for the government to take action based on what the OFR said. I think transparency, especially if disseminated to the public, could allow the public, whether the financial press or financial market participants, to start taking precautions. That's the idea behind who's gonna uh, keep tabs on the regulator. It's the broader public rather than the government itself. Um, the, uh, I think Myron asked a very good question up front, which is, have we gotten used to low volatility? And are we, in a sense, bringing volatility below where it should be? through a variety of policies, government and otherwise. And does that, in a sense, expose us to bigger shocks down the line? Yes, we can buffer the volatility, but at some point we get hit in a very, very big way. I mean, if you look at public debt in industrial countries, it's been building since the 1970s. This is not just the crisis. It's been growing, and you, know, you have to believe that that's buffering some of the volatility in the past. The great moderation was not, uh, you know, completely unrelated to the fact that we try to find ways to buffer the, the volatility. And I think this is really the question industrial countries have to ask. 
how much do we continue buffering it through macro policies can we afford to? And maybe the answer is they continue doing it until they can't, which is what Ireland and, and Greece and to some extent Spain are finding out and what Simon suggests will happen soon to the United States. I'm a little more optimistic that, that we will find a way in the United States and I'm a little more pessimistic that emerging markets, now that they think they've arrived, will have a smooth way forward. I think nothing moves in a straight line. In the history of growth, as Simon knows, is of lurches back and forth. Uh, you know, there are strong growth periods, but I think there are deep problems in every society out there also. Yes, they look better right now, but down the line they will confront, have to confront those problems. And, and so I would suspect that the age of American, I would say dominance certainly is, is nearing an end, but the age of America as the biggest player and the prime mover on international markets is, is still there with us for a long, long time. It's very important, therefore, that the U.S. get it right because the U.S. has been a very positive force across the world. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, uh, the uh, crises are whether we're going to have a crisis over. It depends how you define what over is. As <laughs> everyone's going to have their own view of what over is. But if you uh, look at our major banks uh, today, uh, you know their balance sheets really are very unstable. Uh, the accounting standards have deteriorated dramatically. As I said earlier, we have no disclosure. The banks are still over levered and uh, alive in many cases because of implicit government guarantees. Uh, we know we're not going to do another Lehman, so uh, you know that means that they'll go slowly about adjusting. And, and unfortunately, uh, what worries me as far as crises are concerned is that banks are really wards of the state right now. And therefore, regulators are everywhere, or people who have uh, regulatory areas everywhere. And therefore, well, we don't have competition and individualism and the idea to try to think about how to innovate and to lend in ways that are better for the bank and the persons who are uh, borrowing the money. Then we have influence and corruption. And we have rules that are put into place that. Uh, create lending policies which are mandatory or uh, customer relations and uh, the like that are really um, not in the interest of the economy and the country. So basically the crisis that I see is that with the banks being wards of the state um, that what we have is uh, in the society in the banks now in the hands of regulatory uh, regulators so we have a quasi uh, public private enterprise that that's going to affect our economy, it's going to affect innovation, it's going to affect profitability, it's going to affect uh, the way in which we run our economies. So I think that we have to really think about that and the consequences of that. And I, I talk, you know, the idea of volatility, it's a fascinating question that, you know, we all sort of believe in, in Granger causality or the idea that and we take that into finance. We say when spreads go out or opportunities to make money and economics go, uh, businesses go out, we have a mean reverting type process. You know, we say that entry will come in and it'll, it'll reduce that, uh, those, um, those uh, uh, spreads and make the, uh, and the, and the business will be more efficient. So the business of intermediation or finance is really intermediation. That's what we're doing in finance, we're compressing time. And uh, if we uh, increase the cost of compressing time or innovating or, <laughs> or carrying inventory, that could have profound effects and also create uh, possibilities of future crises. Because as Granger showed and Engel and others that followed, you know, the idea that we can't assume that there's uh, correlation does not mean causation. So you're trying to say as spreads go out, then we have in investment in inventories and adding to capital and investment projects is the way we think about it. But the opposite is also not true. The fact that we, those residuals are uncorrelated and the process looks as though it's now just white noise. The residual process looks like it's white noise. The absence of correlation does not mean there's not causation. 
So we have to always be careful in an integrated system where there's these, uh, the reverse causality could be there. At times, because of the nonlinearities, you could have small weights that'll pass all the tests of looking as though the system is identified. But just because of random shocks, you can end up in a system where the whole system uh, reverses itself so that the intermediaries, or those who are intermediate, as spreads go out, they liquidate, as opposed to the opposite, where spreads go out, they enter the business. And so we don't know that system. And what bothers me about whether the crisis is over is the answer to the question is, are there latent variables or manifold attractors, essentially, that are going to cause future crises to occur? And we don't know because of the nonlinearities that are built into the system. And so I think that that, it, and so we have to think about a capital planning that plans in some way for that eventuality. But the problem is that we forget over time. You know, you get rid of the old traders. You know, they get rid of the people who suffered the shock. You never put the old, the soldiers who fought the last battle up against the, uh, and take the hill again, you bring in fresh troops. Why? Because they would never go there. So the problem <laughs> is how, you can, how do you preserve memory? You know, that's the system, is how do you preserve learning? So you say, is the crisis over? It depends how the memory fades. Can I? Sure. Just wanted five, the last five seconds from what is coincidentally the right side of the table, uh, the thought that occurred to me, and. Uh, what Simon and I were warning about. Imagine you have an entity who's uh, huge with like $13 trillion worth of debt, but its annual I income is only in the $2 trillion range. Uh, its accounting is incredibly obscure. Uh, even when you see what it does, it does things like discount pension liabilities at 9%, and they're still underfunded. Um, all its uh, financing is very short term, so it's financing very short term, most of the financing is under a year, trying to roll over that debt. It's issued lots of off the books credit guarantees and credit enhancements to who knows who, uh, banks, states, whoever else. Uh, this is the world's hugest hedge fund, and, and you know where that leads. So that's the sense in which, uh, you know, this, this could end up as a crisis, and it's kind of the kind of scenario that Simon and I are worrying about. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, keep them short, very short. Uh, anybody? Uh, Doug. First of, first of all, um, I, I completely agree, and I think the panel's agreeing on the debt, on the debt point. I think we, we have various kinds of subsidies, some in the tax code, some, some from other uh, structures, that push housing towards being overly leveraged, but also the rest of the financial system. And I, th I, I go back to this uh, Anat Admati uh, et al. paper and, and, the, and the debate that Raghu and I were just having, which is, I think we need to, we need to ask, everyone in the room hopefully will focus on this question, uh, to what extent is debt, do we need to finance anything in our economy with debt, to what extent is there a productive role of debt, and to what extent is that have we gone far too far in, in that direction? We used to run economies with, with much more equity financing in our financial systems. We don't do that around the world anymore. But I think, for, as Myron said, the degree of lack of knowledge is, is, is profound, not just about housing, but about how all these financial structures will interact going forward. So as long as we have equity, but big equity buffers, I, I think would be okay. But if we're 90, 95% leveraged, we're going to have trouble. To, to, which, to which I could just add, so we have a new Consumer Financial Protection Agency. The number one piece of consumer financial protection I could think of is take the average person and get them out of an investment that's incredibly illiquid, highly leveraged, bears enormous amount of idiosyncratic risk. That's called an owner-occupied house. If you're worried about the, the, all the, if there's plenty of externalities of foreclosures, foreclosures are terrible. 
How do you stop? Well, if people didn't own houses in the first place and, and have mortgages, then there wouldn't be foreclosures. I mean, rent is a, a fine thing. So that certainly is at the root of it. But on the other hand, you know, house, house prices go up and go down for the reason you meant. Stock prices go up and go down. When stocks go down, you know, it doesn't cause a financial crisis. It just causes a little bit of extra drinking that night. It's the, it's the financial structure in which it's held, not the nature of the asset that's particularly awful. Uh, on the savings point, I mean, yes, I think we have been encouraging consumption as the answer to all our problems. Uh, economy goes down, let's get them to consume again. Let's keep interest rates rock bottom. Let's tell the banks, go out and lend. And I think that has to change. I think this goes back to the point about volatility. Consumption has been the answer to reduce economic volatility. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the housing, obviously, that was part of the, uh, I didn't get into it, but I was thinking of that when talking about the idea of having uh, both operating and financing flexibility in uh, the way we ran our affairs. And it, Raghu summarized it very well when he said that, that basically what should the government policy be about informing people that, you know, forget anything about the recent shock, you know, the state of the economy is great, <laughs> keep consuming or keep investing and, and the like. So basically, you know, sometimes if you have a, Maybe there's enough, I think if we can have enough volatility in the system, or continue to have volatility in the system, it would, I think, reduce the possibilities of crises because people would naturally become more cautious. If people want to save more, like we, operating flexibly, we have uh, people didn't save anything. Why? Because they felt their human capital was secure. You know, They didn't have to save. Or it was the case that they could finance their house with uh, a levered or buy six houses or whatever in the subprime debt. Uh, situation because it was uh, always going up. Uh, so um, the the basic the basic issue that you're bringing up is what's the higher level question and what we should do and think about in, in terms of uh, of keeping enough fear in the system. Unless we all believe that we've conquered volatility. If we all believe we've conquered volatility, then what we did was perfect. You know, ex post, it turned out to be wrong, but basically, <laughs> that's the question. I want to thank you for attending this panel, and I want to thank the members of the panel who did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you.